The question I want to answer and apply to all of us this morning is a simple but absolutely important question, a question that none of us should treat lightly. And the question is this, what does it mean to be a man or woman of God? And the words are found at the beginning of our text in the, in the 11th verse of 1 Timothy chapter 6, where Paul wrote, But as for you, O man of God. Ladies, obviously everything in this text applies to you as well, but for the sake of simplicity, I will mostly use the phrase, man of God. We should all care about this question because to be called a man of God is the highest honor God bestows upon men on earth. Consider just the people who have been called a man of God. Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 1, this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel with before his death. Samuel, in 1 Samuel 9, 6, behold, there is a man of God in the city, and he is a man who is held in honor. Elijah and Elisha and 2 Kings were called man of God 34 times in total. And finally, you know, David was called a man after God's very own heart. So to be man of God is like being the valedictorian in the school of Christ. You should care very much about this question because only men of God are fit for the kingdom of God. So if you are apart from Christ this morning, the answer to this question is as important and as precious as the eternal destiny of your soul. So I pray and plead with you that you will consider this question very seriously and carefully. And you should care about this question also because man of God is what we are called to be especially those who are in Christ Jesus. On one hand, the phrase man of God could refer to all the saints in general. So if you are in Christ this morning, you are a man or woman of God. But on the other hand, the man of God also implies a certain level of maturity in the faith. While we will always be little children in relation to our Heavenly Father, He does not hesitate to urge us to to grow up, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and strive for spiritual manhood and maturity. Even though we're always going to be children of God, we're not always going to be spiritually childish and immature. And now Zion walks into the church and he runs around and he lies on the floor. Well, something's seriously wrong if 20 years from now, Zion still walks into the church and still runs around and lies on the floor. We should all be seriously concerned. So it is with us spiritually. There is something wrong. We need to be concerned if we are what we, are, what we were 20 years ago spiritually. Maybe you are very young in the faith this morning. Then this sermon is for you to motivate you to pursue maturity. Maybe you have confessed Christ for many years, but your growth seemed to have come to a stagnation. Then this sermon is for you to admonish and to give you practical directions to seek spiritual growth. And maybe you are a vibrantly growing Christian. Then this sermon is for you to further encourage you to seek the Lord and strive to be a man of God. And again, the question I want to tackle this morning is a simple one. What does it mean to be a man of God. And the answer is found in our text this morning. So if you have the physical copy of the Bible with you, please turn to Paul's first epistle to Timothy, chapter 6. We'll be in verses 11 through 21. First Timothy, chapter 6, verses 11 through 21. First Timothy 6, 11 to 21. Let me read the text for you, and please pay close attention to every verse, because this is the word of God. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, 
to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O oh, Timothy, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Avoid irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Again, the question is, what does it mean for us to be men and women of God? There are three things I want to draw your attention to from the text this morning. It's not the ones in your bulletin. So three, three things to pay attention to from the text. First, a man of God knows God. A man of God knows God. Well, consider what must we know, what, a, what must a man of God know about God and his character? And secondly, a man of God resembles God. A godly man is a man who thinks after the thoughts of God and lives in a manner worthy of Christ. And lastly, a man of God loves the people of God. A man of God loves the people of God. Christianity is not an individualistic religion. It is inseparable from community or communion among the saints. So three points for you this morning. A man of God knows God. He is sound in doctrine. A man of God resembles God. He is godly in his life. And a man of God loves the people of God. And he is a faithful and caring member of Christ's church. So again, Doctrine, life, and church. So let's begin with point number one. A man of God knows God. Phil quoted this without me knowing. Phil quoted this in the Sunday school this morning. A.W. Tozer wrote in the knowledge of the holy. He wrote this. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above his religion. A man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. And for this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous or serious, a portentous or serious fact about any man is not what he at any given time may do or say, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. And Puritan Thomas Watson wrote a book called A Godly Man's Pictures, basically describing what a godly man is like, in which he listed 24 different characteristics that constitute a godly man. And guess what's the first characteristic? Well, he writes, the first fundamental sign is that a godly man is a man of knowledge. A gracious soul has the savor of God's knowledge. In other words, a godly man, a man of God, is first and foremost a man who knows God. And a godless man is first and foremost a man who is ignorant of the character and person of God. I've seen immature Christians who know a great deal of theology, but I've never seen a mature Christian who knows and cares very little about doctrine. So doctrine matters. Your understanding and soundness in doctrine matters because doctrine is the foundation of a man of God. Now, what must we know? What must a man of God know about God? What does the saving knowledge of God consist of? Well, look at our text. Four things from our text. Number one, a man of God must know the imminence and the nearness of of God. A man of God must know the imminence and the nearness of God. Verse 13. Look at verse 13. Verse 13. I charge you in the presence of God 
who gives life to all things. Even though God needed nothing, out of his overflowing abundance, it pleased him to create everything in heaven and on earth. The sun that rises in the morning and the stars that adorn the night sky, the ocean with all its ebb and flow and the moon with all its waxing and waning, they all testify that there is a creator God who made everything by his great might and his immeasurable wisdom. And that everything includes you and me who are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God and according to his likeness. And that means God created us to be his children. He intended that we should always dwell in his presence as his family before him in his household. And we are given the most honorable position in the whole world above all creation as God's representative rulers to subdue the earth and as his disciple makers to proclaim his glory throughout the earth and to tell our children the greatness of the Lord and the wondrous deeds of the Almighty in order that his praise may continue throughout all generations. So do you know this weighty responsibility you have before God? Or have you turned aside from these God-given tasks for all of mankind? Now, God not only gave us life, he also sustains our lives every day. Verse 17. Look at verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So the church you are attending this morning, the vehicles you use to get here, uh, the, the lunch you are about to enjoy in an hour, the friends and family you hang out with this past holiday season, uh, the warm home you'll be returning to this afternoon, even a good night of sleep you got to enjoy last night, these are all provided by God. And in fact, at this very moment, we're all alive, having eyes to read the Word of God and ears to hear the preaching of the Word that is the clearest testimony of God's abundant provision unto our lives. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Matthew 5.45, God makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and unjust. Whether you are in Christ or not this morning, everything you have in this life is given to you freely and generously by our Creator God who owns everything. Now, do you give thanks to your greatest benefactor, or are you, gra and are you grateful to the one who sustains your life and gives you all things to enjoy? Or have you eaten and drunk and, and then forgotten the giver of every good gift? Now, the reality that God gives life and sustains and provides our lives for our lives is the clearest proof that he is imminently near to all of us. Acts 17, 27, Paul said, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. How? Well, he continues, because for in him we live and move and have our being, for we are indeed his offspring. God is very near to us because he has created us and he is sustaining us day by day. And that is the first thing the man of God knows, God's imminence and nearness. Number two, a man of God must know the transcendence and greatness of God. A man of God must know the transcendence and greatness of God. And this is eminently seen in verse, verses 15 and 16. Verses 15 and 16. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. So Paul here is intentionally giving us a picture of the greatness of God, the bigness of our God. He emphasizes God's authority, right, that he is the sovereign ruler over all things, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Uh, therefore, we, as his creature, must obey and submit 
to him and his words. And he has the right to deal with us according to his goodwill and pleasure, however he desires. And then Paul mentions God's immortality and otherness. God is very, very different from all of us. God is not like us. For us, in the midst of life, we are in death, war, pandemic, natural disasters, but God alone has immortality. God cannot die. We live in a world of darkness and evil, but God dwells in unapproachable light. And to cap his description of God's sheer greatness, Paul points out that we do not even have the ability to see God. Right? He is so gloriously exalted, highly extolled, and perfectly holy that none of us could even approach him and draw near to him without his help. Now, what is your view of God? Is he great or is he small? Is he transcendent and different or is he just like one of us? Have you ever thought, well, because men are prone to frustration and anger, because I and you and I are prone to frustration and anger, God must be dreadfully provoked and angry at us for every failure and sin of our lives. Have you ever thought, because powerful men tend to abuse their power, then God must not be perfectly good if he is perfectly powerful? Well, have you ever thought, because men usually expect us to return their favor to us, maybe God's free grace is not free after all, and we need to repay him. We need to do him favors with our own good works and merits. I would venture to say that most of our miseries and troubles in life originate from this one thing, that we have too small a view of the character of God. The chief reason why our faith is little and immature is because we think the object of our faith is just like one of us. He is in, no, he is in nature no different from any of us. Isaiah 40, 25. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high as he who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Brothers and sisters, if you want to mature and grow strong in the faith, if you want to be a man of God, you must know the deeply struck, you must be deeply struck by the glory and the greatness, the transcendence and the, and the greatness and the otherness of our God. Number three, a man of God must know the appearance and the lowliness of Christ. A man of God must know the appearance and lowliness of Christ. In, in the midst of verse 13, where God is called upon as the, the creator of all things, and verse 15, where God is extolled as the sovereign king, we also see in verse 13, look at verse 13, the second half of verse 13. Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. So in the midst of the greatness and the glory of God, we also see the lowliness and humiliation of Christ. So let's think about this verse a little more carefully. The eternal Son of God, who is himself the creator of all things, who is himself highly exalted in heaven, this eternal Son of God became a man, a man, Christ Jesus. And why did he become a man? Verse 13, so that he could stand before Pontius Pilate and then be crucified on the cross. Well, why was he crucified? I think you and I know the answer very well. Well, he needed to be crucified because we have sinned and because we have denied and despised the creator God. And because we, we all by nature, were haters of God, children of darkness, and enemies of Christ Jesus. And all these sins, they have consequences, the consequence of death eternal. So Christ Jesus bore our sins upon his shoulder, suffered the death penalty of our sins we rightly deserve on the cross, endured the wrath of God reserved for sinners in our place, so that our sin debt may be canceled and our souls preserved from God's fury, and our eternal happiness secured. So that now, whoever repents and believes and trusts in him shall not perish in the lake of fire, but be raised 
to everlasting life. Now, verse 13. It also says, Christ Jesus made a good confession before Pontius Pilate. What was his confession? What was this good confession before Pontius Pilate? Well, for that, you have to go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 37. For this purpose, I was born, and for this purpose, I have come into the world. That's important, right? Jesus is telling us his purpose coming into this world. What is it? What is Jesus' mission? To bear witness to the truth. The truth of our sins and rebellion against God. The truth of our misery and our death in sin. And the truth of our salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. And again, there is no great secret to, to godliness. Right? Paul said in 1 Timothy 3, 16, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. This is the mystery of godliness. This is your secret ingredient to godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. The man of God, the secret ingredient for him is to know Christ Jesus. A man of God must know Christ Jesus. So come to know and trust in and treasure our crucified Savior. Number four, last thing, a man of God must know. A man of God must know the reappearance and the awesomeness of Christ. The reappearance and the awesomeness of Christ. Verse 14, verse 14. To keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. The story of the Bible does not end with the death, crucifixion, and burial of Christ Jesus. On the third day after his death, Christ rose from the grave, broke loose the bondage of death, and ascended on high to everlasting life. So now he is seated at the right hand of God, waiting for the day of his return. And what will he do when he returns? Well, Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So for those of you who are in Christ Jesus, Christ will come back to bring us with him, so that where he is, we may be also. But for those of you who are apart from Christ Jesus, he will return for a different purpose. Revelation 19:11. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. So Christ will return to judge the living and the dead, to bring reward to his people, and to execute justice upon his enemies and haters. It will be an awesome and glorious day, because Christ will be displayed and exalted through the salvation of his people, the saints, I am the enemies of his, uh, the, the condemnation of his enemies, uh, the sinners. And that is what a man of God eagerly looks forward to. And not only for his own salvation, but for the final vindication and glorification of the name of Christ. And that is what a man of God must know. He must know the, the imminence and the transcendence of God. He must know the lowliness and the exaltation of of Christ. The godly Robert Murray McShane wrote this, Often the doctrine of Christ for me appears common, well known, having nothing new in it, and I am tempted to pass it by and go to some scripture more taking. This is the devil again, a red hot lie. Christ for us is ever new, ever glorious unsearchable riches of Christ, the only one for a guilty soul. Is the doctrine of Christ ever glorious, ever new to you? Do you know that if you search and dig deeper into the Word of God, diligently, patiently, I am prayerfully, there are unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus for your soul. I pray that in this new year, Christ will be ever glorious, ever new to all of our guilty souls. And now, what does a man of God do with this knowledge? We know all these things. What do we do with them? 
Well, defensively, a man of God guards the knowledge of God. Defensively, we guard the knowledge of God. Verse 20. Look at verse 20. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. What is this precious deposit entrusted to us? Or well, why is there a need for us to guard this deposit? We'll continue in verse 20. Avoid irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. And that's to say what we need to guard and protect and fight for is precisely this knowledge of God and the purity of the gospel. This is something we can never compromise because we know there are all kinds of falsehood in the world that seek to adulterate, corrupt, and pollute the gospel. The word guard here is often used in the New Testament to refer to God's keeping and guarding and protecting of our souls. And that's to say, we're to watch over God's gospel just as God watches over our own souls. That's how much we should endeavor to protect the gospel, to keep it pure, holy, and unstained. And that's defensively. We are to protect and keep the gospel free from any falsehood and human cunning. And offensively, right, a man of God not only guards, but also spreads and proclaims this knowledge of God. Paul never fails to emphasize this to his young Padawan Timothy. Right, chapter 4, verse 11. Command and teach these things. Chapter 6, verse 2. Teach and urge these things. 2 Timothy 4, 1. We just read that earlier. I charge you. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, this weighty charge, what is this weighty charge? Preach the word. You may not be called to preach, but you are called to proclaim. You may not be called to teach, but you are called to reach out to the lost souls with the gospel of Christ Jesus. And because that is what it means to be a man of God. A man of God knows God and makes God known. And that's number one. Number two, there's more. Point number two, a man of God resembles God. A man of God resembles God. Again, Robert Murray McShane wrote, it is not great talents God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. And again, Thomas Watson, a godly man bears God's name an image. Godliness is God-likeness. It is one thing to profess God, another thing to resemble him. It's as simple as that. A man of God is a believer of the true God. He professes the truth. He knows the truth. But even more importantly, a man of God is a man who resembles God. Now, in what ways must a man of God resemble God? Well, let's look at the text. Number one, Three things. Number one, a man of God resembles God in his character. A man of God resembles God in his character. The character of God could be fittingly summarized by one word, holiness. And so God commands all who profess his name to be holy. 1 Peter 1, 15. But as, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. A godly man must be godlike in godliness and holiness. And what does being holy look like for a man? Verse 11. Look at verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. What are these things? Right? These things refer to the sins in the previous text. In verse 4 of 1 Timothy 6, conceit, envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicion. Verse 5, constant friction, disunity among people. Verse 9, senseless and harmful desire for riches, which then leads to all kinds of evils. Uh, therefore, to be holy, then first and foremost, must mean that we must flee from sin. There's no bravery to venture into sin, into temptation, and it is no cowardice to flee from evil. The strength of our faith is not measured by how close we can get or we can go near temptation and not sin, 
Rather, it is measured by how fast we run the opposite direction when we see the first rising of sin in our hearts. Every man of God must learn to resist the temptation of sin by not flirting with, with sin but running away from it. It is not lot that we should admire who was surrounded by the immoralities and the wickedness of the sodomites, even though he was called a righteous man. It is Joseph who should be the example of our faith, who upon the first sight of temptation left his garment, fled, and got out of the house. That's who we should imitate and, and go after. Brothers and sisters, what sins do you flirt with? What sins do you desperately need to flee from? Well, maybe it's looking at, looking at other people's social media posts and becoming jealous or covetous. Maybe it is watching pornography late at night. Maybe it is talking juicy gossips behind people's backs. Or maybe it's anger quietly simmering or violently exploding in your mind. Whatever it might be, brothers and sisters, remember this exhortation of Paul. O oh, man of God, flee these things. But fleeing is not enough. We must not only run away from sin, we must at the same time run toward something else. Continue in verse 11. Verse 11. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Righteousness and godliness, first two things. These are the general directions in which a man of God progresses. He seeks to do what is right and honorable to the Lord at all times, in all situations. That is righteousness. And he does so with great zeal, fervor, and joy. That is godliness. Faith and love, the, the second two items, faith and love are specific virtues a man of God pursues. He trusts the person and promises of God in every circumstance, whatever happens to him. That is faith. And he adores, admires, and reveres the Lord, and he sacrifices himself for the service of God and his people. That is love. And steadfastness and gentleness, the fifth and the sixth, the last two items on the list, these are the manner in which a man of God, a man of God pursues holiness. This is the manner we pursue holiness. The word steadfast in Greek literally means remain constant, remain the same under pressure. And that's to say, whatever our lot in life is, this one pursuit of holiness and quest for godliness, it should be constant and should be unchanging. But as we continually grow in godliness by God's grace, the mature man is to be gentle, meek, and lowly, not looking down upon the weak and the feeble, the struggling and the immature, but caring for them in kindness and humility. That is what we pursue. God is holy in that he hates sin and he loves righteousness. And so a man of God also hates sin. He flees from it in order that he might pursue righteousness wholeheartedly and incessantly. And so we must resemble God in his character and his character of holiness. And number two, a man of God resembles God in his words. A man of God resembles God in his words words. Verse 12. Verse 12. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So why did Paul remind Timothy of his, his confession? Well, it's because of what we saw in verse 13. Because our Lord Jesus himself in his testimony before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. Exact same words. In other words, just as the Lord Jesus made the good confession, we ought to follow his example. And Paul said Christ made a good confession. That's to say all of his words are true, full of spiritual good and benefits to those who hear. And that's to say all of our words must be full of grace and truth at all times as well. Our words should strive to encourage, to build up, and to edify one another. And Christ Jesus not only made a good confession, he made a good confession publicly. Right? Christ made a confession before Pontius Pilate, 
the Jews and the Roman soldiers. And therefore, Paul is reminding Timothy here that his confession was not only a private one, a good and true confession, it, is also, it was also made in the presence of many witnesses. And Christ's confession was not only good and public, it was also made in front of a hostile audience, the people who shouted, crucify, crucify, and a Roman governor who had no desire to execute justice, and, and the Pharisees who hated him to the core. But Christ didn't shrink back uh, in, timidity, in timidity and fear, but he proclaimed the truth and demonstrated his, this truth through his life, death, and resurrection. And brothers and sisters, that's what we are called to do. We are called to make a good and public confession before this hostile world. He is now sending you and me into this, this world, like sheep among wolves, like doves in the midst of vultures. But unto us is entrusted the pure gospel. So I urge you this day to not be ashamed of the gospel, for it is a power of God to bring salvation to everyone who believes. May we truly resemble Christ Jesus in the words that we speak, in the good public confession of the truth. Number three, a man of God resembles God in his works. The man of God resembles God in his character of holiness, in his words, and in his works. A godly man not only professes Jesus with his lips, his life is an accurate reflection of that truth he confesses. Verse 13, verse 13. Look at what Paul is doing here. Verse 13, I charge you, just a charge, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. Paul is saying, I'm charging you and I'm calling upon the Lord God and and the Lord Jesus. I'm charging you this. What is this charge charge that is so solemn that that Paul invoked the name of God and of Christ Jesus? Verse 14, that's the serious charge. Verse 14, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach. The Greek of this verse is a little ambiguous, but based on the context, it seems more sensible to translate it as to keep the commandment and keep yourself unstained from unfree from reproach. In other words, it's not so much about Timothy protecting God's command, but more about Timothy keeping and obeying God's command. Faith produces obedience. Faith motivates obedience. Faith upholds obedience. The 689 London Baptist Confession, chapter 11, paragraph 2, on justification. Faith thus receiving and resting on Christ and his righteousness is the alone instrument of justification. Justification through faith. That's the doctrine we stand upon. Justification through faith. Yet, yet it is not alone in the person justified, but is ever accompanied with all other saving graces and is no dead faith, but worketh by love. Faith produces Obedience, faith also produces hope for eternal life. Verse 12, look at verse 12. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. A godly man looks forward to the eternal life with eager expectation. For those of you who are not from New York, it is that yearning you have every holiday season. You mark it down on your calendar, you count down every morning, and you look forward to it every day. It's the same thing here. Once the spiritual eyes of our hearts are opened, and we see the wondrous things to come in the next life, communion with the trying God, never-ending worship of the Son, our body and soul perfected and renewed, everlasting joy and bliss. When we see these things, we cannot help but long for it daily. Or using Paul's words here, we take hold of the eternal life. And the word here literally means aggressively seize. And it's that longing with intensity. But the tragedy is we, also, we are also often drowned in the ocean of the present and thus become so oblivious to the future and that which is to come. 
Much of our murmuring, misery, complaints, and troubles, it could be avoided if we could simply keep an eternal perspective. Are you unhappy? Are you anxious about the uncertainty of the present? Are you cumbered with a load of care? Well, then remember to take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. So just to summarize, the man of God, a godly man, is a is a Christ-like man, a man that resembles God in his character of holiness and in hating sin and pursuing righteousness. He resembles God in his words, making courageous confession of the truth before the hostile world. A man of God resembles God in his works. He keeps a commandment and takes hold of the eternal life. And now, if you have been paying close attention to our exposition so far, you probably noticed that I skipped a part, and probably the most well-known part of this entire text is in verse 12. The most well-known part of this text, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. We have just seen the what of becoming more God-like. I believe this is the how of becoming more God-like, by fighting the good fight of faith. And notice what Paul does not say. Paul does not say, live the good life of faith, or work the good work of faith, or walk the good walk of faith. He says, fight the good fight of faith. And he doubles down on this analogy in 2 Timothy 4, 7, which we just read earlier. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. The Christian life is a costly fight because we are to expect great adversity and trials on our journey to greater godliness and Christ-likeness. There will be crosses, losses and crosses, afflictions, persecutions, suffering and mourning. You must fight against the sin, your sins within and temptations without. You must endure devastating sickness and disease. You must suffer through many losses, disappointments, and unfulfilled desires in this life. This is all part of the fight. I don't know what every one of you is going through. I know some of your troubles, griefs, and heartaches, but I want all of you to remember these words. Fight the good fight of faith. Know that this is a good fight. It is good fight. It is good because God sovereignly and wisely ordained every affliction that we might, that we might become strong and mature men of God. James 1-2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and less steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing." Brothers and sisters, this fight, our fight, has one purpose and one purpose only. God is making us stronger and more steadfast in the faith. None of your tears and sweats, grief and mourning will ever be wasted. They're all tools in the gentle hands of the divine sculptor to mold us into the image of Christ. And also, know that this is not a fair fight because you have a decisive advantage in this fight. It is not a fair fight, because you have advantage in this fight. When Paul wrote, fight the good fight of faith, he is not imagining you standing in the same ring with Muhammad Ali, trembling with fear, knowing that you are going to get knocked out in the first round. In this fight of faith, you are Muhammad Ali. In this fight of faith, you will be the last man standing. In this fight of faith, you will surely emerge triumphantly and victoriously. You will surely win this fight because Christ himself has promised. In this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. The winds and waves of life will knock you down, but it will not knock you out. The hand that rescued you from sin and death will surely preserve you to the very end. This good fight of faith, it is divinely rigged. It has only one possible outcome, godliness and victory for those who are in Christ Jesus. And very briefly, point number three, point number three. 
A man of God loves the people of God. So a man of God knows God, a man of God resembles God, and a man of God loves the people of God. In the previous passage, Paul admonished us regarding the great danger of the love of money and craving for earthly riches. If you look at verse 10, the famous verse you all know, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But he did not say what the proper use of, of our earthly riches and possessions is. Well, that's because he saved that instruction for our text this morning. So first, he, wants us, he warns us what not to do with our earthly riches. Verse 17, what not to do with our riches. Verse 17 says, As for the rich in this present age, Charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. The word haughty here is not the typical word for, for pride. The Greek word is, is only used once, only once here in the whole New Testament. It literally means high-mindedness. It's the word high, a mind shoved together, high-mindedness. And that's the chief danger of becoming rich in the world. There's nothing, nothing wrong for receiving riches in this world, but there's danger coming with it. And the chief danger is it tends to puff up our minds and inflate our egos. Uh, we're more tempted and prone to exalt ourselves above others and cultivate a false sense of superiority and security. And suddenly we think we're the most important people in, in our social circles. So let's beware that pride and conceit not, do not creep into our minds and our hearts when the Lord blesses us with a lot of earthly abundance in this life. And Paul also warned the, the wealthy believers to not set their hope on earthly possessions. Not set their hope on earthly possessions. And actually, Paul does not say, do not set your hope on, on riches. He says, I quote, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. And Paul here is emphasizing the folly of setting one's hope on riches. It's just because the riches of our lives, they're very uncertain. It is foolish because riches are uncertain. And the prices of stocks or bitcoins or whatever you have and financial instrument you have in your portfolio, they fluctuate daily. And as an economist, I, I can responsibly tell you all bubbles burst eventually. The value of property the value of property you own could also drastically decline over a short period of time. And even the money you have sitting quietly in, in your bank accounts, they go down in value every year uh, due to inflation. Uh, now, if you care nothing about the above, and you don't care, uh, then I want you still to carefully consider the example of Job, uh, who lost all his possessions on a single day. And consider the rich fool who told himself, so you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat and drink and be merry. And God responded by saying, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? And consider the words of our Lord Jesus, that moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal your treasures on earth. Fickle men who build their hopes upon uncertain riches are like building sand castles on a beach. And it will soon tumble and collapse at the sight of the first wave. Great possessions are not to be our comfort and our security in this life. Now, what then should we do with riches and resources we have in this life that God blessed us with? Well, first of all, let's be thankful for them. In verse 17, we ought to set our hope on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. What do we have in this life that was not first given to us by God? If so, then let's receive all things with gratitude and thankfulness to enjoy every good gift, including the earthly riches, with a deep thankfulness and gratefulness and humility. And then Paul continues in verse 18. Look at verse 18. They are to do good, to be rich in good works. Okay, that's not so controversial, right? A man of God should resemble God in doing good works, right? Well, then keep reading. Verse 18. To be generous and ready to share. Did your heart sink a little bit? Ready to share. Generous 
expresses the desire of the heart. Well, the Greek word is literally the prefix for good and the verb give, shove together, good give, good giving. Right? That's to say a generous man is him who delights in giving to others the good he himself first received from God. His joy is not so much about possessing great things in this life, but in sharing it with others. He is deeply convinced and convicted by the word of our Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So generosity is the general disposition of our hearts to share. But there is more. A godly man is not only generous, he must also be ready to share. And this share requires a few things on the, on the parts of, of the share. It requires us to do a couple of things. And he must first recognize the needs of God's people. I hear the Greek word is a koinonikos, which is derived from the word communion or fellowship among the people in the same church, koinonia. So in other words, a man who is ready to share must be a man who is first ready to be in communion with his fellow saints in the church. This man must be a member of a local church, a man who is willing to do more than just showing up at church an hour and a half every Sunday and sitting in the pew for an hour and a half and leaving for home right after service. This man must be diligent and eager to find out what the people of God are going through, and he wants to help. And he wants to encourage and care for them in any possible way. And we can only discover the needs of the people of God and the struggles of our brothers if we reach out to them during the week. Right, so so take, out, take out your membership directory and then contact a few people. Pick two or three people you want to reach out to this week and figure out their needs and how you may be praying for them, encouraging them, and practically helping them. Because readiness to share requires our readiness to fellowship, not just on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week. But that alone is not enough. James 2.15, you know James reproof. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? In other words, after getting to know the needs of the people of God, it is also incumbent on us to give, to share, and to expect nothing in return. Right? In the early church, the, the wealth gap between the rich and the poor in the church was a lot bigger than our social context, social and economic context. Most of us, most of you are not in dire financial need at all. However, there's still a lot of opportunities to share, even in Grace Baptist. Right? One of the things that impressed me the most when I was here is how much you guys stay in touch with each other during the week through texts and, and messages. Right? Opportunity to, opportunities to love and, and share and care for people in the church uh, can be found in your bulletins and church-wide announcements. And if you have the financial ability, open your homes, open your wallets, and share with those who you love and care for in the church. Because our love for one another is not only in words, not only in desires, but also in acts of sharing. And just one last thing, one last thing. You may say, well, I'm, I'm not one of those people Paul calls rich in the world, rich in the present age. I have no spare riches to give away. I, I live from paycheck to paycheck. Oh, I don't have anything. Well, that's okay. But I think this principle of generosity and sharing is still applicable to all of us. All because maybe some of us are not blessed with material riches, but all of us are surely blessed with spiritual gifts and riches for the good of others in the church. Right? First Peter 4, 8, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. And how do we do that? As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. In other words, each of us has been enriched with one or more than one uh, God-given spiritual gifts. And it's our responsibility to discover it, to sharpen it, and to put it to use for the spiritual good of others in the church. So I pray that we'll not be idle in this regard because a man of God loves the people of God. He seeks to know their physical and spiritual needs, and he gives and shares with eagerness, generosity, and great joy. And that is what it means to be a man of God. He knows God, he is sound in doctrine, and he, is, uh, he resembles God, he is godly in his life, and he loves the people of God. He is an active member of the household of God.
Let's pray. Lord, our God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praises for the word that you have given us. It's a blueprint. It is a guideline for us to grow in godliness and maturity so that we may gradually be conformed into the image of Christ Jesus. He is the mystery of godliness. He is our Savior and our Lord, the foundation of all holiness in this life. I pray that you will help us to resemble him, to live in a manner after him worthy of the gospel. I pray that you will stir up in our hearts the desire to know you, uh, to walk in a manner uh, worthy of the gospel, and to, to love the people of God in our daily lives, in our desires, in our love, in our sharing I pray. I pray that Grace Baptist Church will be built up by your spirit, according to your grace, and joined together as one body of Christ before you, we pray. Amen.